Hey everyone, welcome to a special installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today we're going to be taking a look back at 2023 and uncovering five of my favourite Harry Potter theories that I covered throughout the year. And when I say five, I actually mean six, because I couldn't decide on which five to go with. I know we're a little far into 2024 already, but my intention is to do these every year. Anyway, I won't dawdle any longer, let's get into it. How Snape Learned to Fly Without a Broom Today, we're going to be discussing a theory centered around Severus Snape and his ability to fly. We're also going to be challenging the conventional notion that Voldemort was the one to teach him. But right off the bat, I need to make something clear here. When I say fly, I do not mean with a broom. I'm referencing Snape's ability to travel through the air without the use of the traditional flying device, a rare and exceptional ability limited to a very select few in the Harry Potter series. In the Harry Potter films, we see the Death Eaters fly on numerous occasions, the first time being in the Order of the Phoenix. We see them flying again later on in the Half-Blood Prince while attacking various communities, and because we saw them fly right in front of our eyes, it has led many fans to believe that any run-of-the-mill Death Eater can in fact fly. However, this is certainly not the case. The books at no point depict the Death Eaters flying, only apparating. Therefore, the simple answer to this conundrum is that filmmakers, in the name of producing interesting visual effects, simply made apparition or teleportation look like flying. But just because the Death Eaters couldn't fly, it certainly doesn't mean that no one could. In fact, there are two wizards that come to mind when I think of flying. Lord Voldemort and Severus Snape, and it just so happens that both of these wizards possess the ability known as unsupported flight. And then Harry saw him. Voldemort was flying like smoke on the wind, without broomstick or thestral to hold him, his snake-like face gleaming out of the blackness, his white fingers raising his wand again. J.K. Rowling is reported to have stated that all wizards have the power of flight innately, but that the vast, vast majority need a broom to achieve it. In Voldemort's case, he was so focused and powerful that he was able to channel the power to fly unsupported, harnessing the energy through himself rather than the broom. This rare achievement is indicative of a truly powerful witch or wizard. We also see Severus Snape, aka the only other known flying wizard, fly away from Hogwarts in the Deathly Hallows. He jumped, said Professor McGonagall. You mean he's dead? Harry sprinted to the window. No, he's not dead, said McGonagall. He seems to have learned a few tricks from his master. In the books, McGonagall speculates that Snape has developed his ability to fly through his proximity to Voldemort. Voldemort was, at one stage, widely thought to be the only known wizard to possess the ability to fly. Therefore, this was a reasonable assertion by McGonagall. If Voldemort is the only known flyer, and suddenly Snape can fly, it stands to reason that Voldemort would have been the one to teach him. However, here's where the theory starts to creep in. While conventional wisdom would suggest that Voldemort taught Snape to fly, I think it's actually the opposite. While both wizards have a history of continually challenging the wizarding status quo, inventing spells and experimenting with all sorts of new magic, Flying seems much more like something that Snape would have pursued. Voldemort was far too preoccupied with extending his life and his exploration of spells on the darker side of the spectrum. Another strong argument against Voldemort being the one to teach Snape is that Voldemort, much like with his Horcruxes, would never share magic that would make him exceptional. If he and he alone had developed the ability to fly, there's no chance he would share it with his followers even if it gave him a competitive edge. Voldemort, after all, was arrogant and wildly overconfident. But this does leave one big question on the table. If Voldemort didn't teach Snape to fly, then who did? Enter Lily Evans. Laughing, Lily swung higher than her sister. She quivered with excitement about what she was going to do. Lily, don't do it, shrieked Petunia. But her words came too late. Lily had already let go of the swing, 
and was soaring higher and higher into the air. But the girl had let go of the swing at the very height of its arc and flown into the air, quite literally flown, launched herself skyward with a great shout of laughter. And instead of crumpling on the playground asphalt, she soared like a trapeze artist through the air, staying up far too long, landing far too lightly. Lily had always loved doing this. The feel of soaring through the air was one of her favorite things. Mummy told you not to, Petunia stopped her swing by dragging the heels of her sandals on the ground, making a crunching, grinding sound, then leapt up, hands on hips. Mummy said you weren't allowed, Lily. But I'm fine, said Lily, still giggling. Tuny, look at this. Watch what I can do. The text above suggests that Lily Evans may have been the first witch in the Wizarding World to inadvertently dip her feet in the realm of flight. And who did Snape spend a considerable amount of time with in his youth? Why, Lily Evans, of course. Born on January 9th, 1960, Severus Snape was raised in the muggle dwelling of Spinner's End, a shabby suburb of Cokeworth. Attempting to escape the misery of his home life, Severus would often spend his time wandering about his neighborhood. As this was an area where the majority of inhabitants are muggles, most of the encounters Severus had with his neighbors were with people who neither descended from magical families nor had magical abilities of their own. So it was likely for this reason that Snape was so excited when, at the age of nine, he happened upon the Evans sisters, Lily and Petunia, and quickly became aware of Lily's abilities to perform magic. It is said that Severus almost immediately fell for Lily, and the sheer fact that she could do a little magic probably had him spellbound. And almost immediately after meeting one another, Snape began to introduce Lily to a lot of Wizarding World firsts. Because Lily had hailed from a muggle family, she didn't even know that the Wizarding World existed until Snape explained things to her. And all thanks to Snape, Lily very quickly became accustomed to all things magical, priming her entry into the Wizarding World. But I'm of the impression that these lessons weren't entirely one-sided. Sure, Snape taught Lily a lot about the Wizarding World, but what if Lily had some things to teach Snape? As a young man, Snape was infatuated with Lily, and her discovery of a relatively unknown and unexplored magical ability like flight would have undoubtedly fueled his affection for her even further. Now, I'm not implying that Lily Evans, a young witch with zero exposure to the Wizarding World, could fly like Snape and Voldemort could in the later books, and I'm certainly not implying that the above passage dictates that. However, it is one of the only passages in the books referencing flight in any way, shape, or form. It's also the earliest example. It's also well documented in the books that some witches and wizards have certain predispositions to certain spells or abilities, and it's entirely possible that Lily's special talent was flight, or at least the very early stages of it. Before attending Hogwarts, Lily had no connection to the wizarding world beyond Snape, so it stands to reason that she would have shared her limited knowledge with him during their time together. And she'd hardly be the only witch or wizard in the story who kept a unique bit of magic secret. Voldemort had his horcruxes, Snape had his book full of spells, and the Marauders had their Animagus abilities. Flight could have been Snape and Lily's little secret. As to how Voldemort ended up with the ability, well, there are a few possibilities. The first being that Voldemort simply figured out flying all by himself. He was one of the most powerful wizards of all time, and when he set his mind to something, he can often achieve it. Him developing the ability to fly all on his own is not outside the realm of possibility. And the second is that Voldemort saw Snape flying and subsequently demanded that he teach him the ability. Snape had to conceal many things from Voldemort over the years, and knowing the power of Voldemort as a legilimens, it's entirely possible that he recognized he would have to concede some secrets to the Dark Lord during periods of close proximity. On a closing note, I'd also like to mention that, according to Rowling, every witch or wizard has the innate ability to fly. It's just a matter of becoming powerful, focused enough to channel it. Just like a young wizard learns to fly on a broomstick, witches and wizards will need to work hard if they wish to graduate to unsupported flying. 
The real reason Dumbledore borrowed the Cloak of Invisibility Today, we're going to be discussing Dumbledore, the Potters, and the fabled Invisibility Cloak. Specifically, we're going to be taking a look at the events of the time period surrounding the Potter's murder, and why on earth Dumbledore chose to borrow an item of such great protection when the Potter family's lives were in imminent danger. If the cloak is so powerful that even death can't find you, wouldn't it be most useful in the hands of people who are hiding from the most powerful dark wizard to have ever lived? Let's dive in. The Invisibility Cloak is a powerful magical artifact that once belonged to Ignotus Peveril, the youngest brother from the Tale of Three Brothers, a story outlining the origin of each Deathly Hallow. The plot surrounds the Three Wizard Brothers and their ability to cheat death for a short period of time. After conquering death, a personification of death, under the guise of congratulating them, awards them with three gifts. The Elder Wand, the Resurrection Stone, and the Invisibility Cloak. Long story short, each brother chose one of the gifts that death had presented them. Ignotus, the youngest, chose the Invisibility Cloak. All three of these objects are massively instrumental in the Harry Potter story, and while the Elder Wand is a huge plot driver, the Invisibility Cloak definitely ended up being the most useful hallow for Harry, which is interesting because it was indirectly handed down to him by his father. After James's death, it was kept safe until Harry was old enough to appreciate it, at which point Dumbledore anonymously gifted the cloak to Harry in the Philosopher's Stone. But why did Dumbledore have this Potter family artifact? Around the time that Lord Voldemort was hunting the Potters, the Cloak of Invisibility came to the attention of Dumbledore when James showed it to him. And after a cursory inspection of the cloak, Dumbledore ended up asking to borrow the cloak from James in order to study it. But this was a bit of a weird request. Dumbledore had the power to cast the Disillusionment Charm, a spell capable of rendering him invisible, allowing him to perfectly blend in with his surroundings. What use could he have possibly had with the Invisibility Cloak? And of all of the times to borrow it, this seems like the most inappropriate. The most obvious and safe answer is that Dumbledore wanted to study the cloak because it's one of the three Deathly Hallows. In his youth, Dumbledore became infatuated with the idea of uniting the three Hallows, and though he had long since abandoned that path, he maintained an interest in these powerful magical artifacts. Being a highly knowledgeable and curious wizard, it's possible that he may have wanted to explore the cloak's capabilities and better understand its origins. Furthermore, it's likely that Dumbledore did not feel that James Potter needed the Invisibility Cloak for protection against Lord Voldemort, as the family was already safeguarded by the Fidelius Charm, a powerful enchantment that concealed the location of the Potter family from Voldemort. But of course, we all know how well the Fidelius Charm worked out for them. After being betrayed by their secret keeper, Peter Pettigrew, all of the Potters but Harry were killed after Voldemort entered their cottage in Godric's Hollow. With James killed, the cloak was left in Dumbledore's possession. He later explains the origins of the cloak to Harry. The cloak, as you know now, traveled down through the ages, father to son, mother to daughter, right down to Ignotus's last living descendant, who was born, as Ignotus was, in the village of Godric's Hollow. Dumbledore smiled at Harry. Me? You. You have guessed. I know why the cloak was in my possession on the night your parents died. James had showed it to me just a few days previously. But there's something that feels off about all of this. The Potters were in immense danger. They had the most dangerous dark wizard of all time specifically targeting them, and they went to extreme measures to stay hidden, enlisting the help of the Fidelius Charm. How could Dumbledore have had such a major oversight in borrowing the cloak from James? How could he have been so obtuse? Dumbledore is a calculated, powerful, wise old wizard that's typically steps ahead of everyone. Something doesn't sit right with me here. Hold on to your broomsticks, because I've got a scandalous theory. I think that Dumbledore may have deliberately borrowed the cloak with the intention of leaving the Potter family more vulnerable to Lord Voldemort. Hear me out. I think that Dumbledore's actions in this scenario spell out a strategic and calculated decision, rather than mere curiosity. I think that Dumbledore, who had deep knowledge of the prophecy regarding Harry Potter and Voldemort, 
recognize the potential significance of the cloak in the upcoming conflict. By borrowing the cloak, it's possible that he sought to manipulate the course of events to align with his vision of defeating Voldemort. And one possible motivation behind this theory is Dumbledore's belief in the concept of the greater good. Dumbledore was aware of this prophecy and its importance, as well as the fact that Voldemort was seeking to destroy the Potter family in order to eliminate the one who could defeat him. It's possible that Dumbledore saw borrowing the invisibility cloak as a calculated move in fulfilling the prophecy and ultimately defeating Voldemort. He may have reasoned that sacrificing the immediate protection offered by the invisibility cloak would ultimately lead to a more advantageous outcome, such as enabling Harry to fulfill his role in the prophecy and ultimately defeat Voldemort. This theory also challenges the notion that Dumbledore saw no need for the invisibility cloak due to the Fidelius charm. Instead, it suggests that he intentionally gambled with the safety of the Potter family, placing greater importance on the overall outcome of the battle against Voldemort. Dumbledore's manipulation of events throughout the series suggests time and time again that he was willing to take risks for the sake of the greater good. He orchestrated the events leading up to the Battle of Hogwarts, even knowingly placing Harry in harm's way to ultimately defeat Voldemort. Borrowing the invisibility cloak would not be out of character for Dumbledore, as it aligned with its willingness to make difficult decisions and sacrifices in service of the larger goal. But I know that there are some fans out there who can't possibly rationalize or come to terms with the idea that Dumbledore may be evil, so I'll also introduce some counterpoints to this theory. The main counter argument is just what the story tells us, that Dumbledore made the decision to borrow the invisibility cloak out of pure curiosity. I mentioned earlier that there's no way Dumbledore could have been so obtuse as to borrow the cloak without consideration for the repercussions of his actions, but there may be a hole in that assertion. You see, when it comes to the Deathly Hallows, Dumbledore can be a bit of a blustering buffoon. Ever since his youth, Dumbledore had a long-standing and dangerous obsession with the three magical artifacts, and it's entirely possible that the dangling carrot that was the opportunity to inspect the invisibility cloak may have caused him to act out of character. Dumbledore's dangerous obsession with the Three Deathly Hallows can be attributed to several factors, including his thirst for knowledge, his desire for power, and his fascination with the mysteries of life and death. Firstly, Dumbledore was known for his insatiable thirst for knowledge and understanding. He was a highly intelligent wizard who delved deep into the realms of magic, history, and ancient artifacts. The Deathly Hallows, with their immense power and significance, would undoubtedly have piqued Dumbledore's intellectual curiosity. He would have been drawn to their legend and the potential understanding they could provide about the nature of magic itself. Secondly, Dumbledore's desire for power cannot be overlooked. While he was primarily driven by a desire to protect and bring about good, there were instances where his hunger for power and influence was revealed. The Deathly Hallows, especially the Elder Wand, represented the ultimate power in the wizarding world. Possessing all three hallows would have granted Dumbledore an unprecedented level of control and authority, which may have enticed him. Dumbledore has a good line on this. It is a curious thing, but perhaps those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Furthermore, Dumbledore had a deep fascination with life and death and sought to unlock their mysteries. The Deathly Hallows symbolized the mastery over death, and Dumbledore's exploration of this theme was evident in his research and encounters with various magical artifacts throughout his life. The Hallows represented a way for Dumbledore to understand and potentially even conquer death, which may have fueled his obsession. While Dumbledore ultimately used his knowledge and power for the greater good, his dangerous obsession with the Deathly Hallows hints at the potential for him to become consumed by ambition and to lose sight of his noble intentions. It's also possible that his fascination with these objects clouded his judgment, causing him to overlook things like the Potters potentially needing the cloak to protect themselves. A good example of Dumbledore's clouded judgment can be accurately exemplified by his interaction with Marvolo Gaunt's ring. Dumbledore put on the Horcrux ring, also known as Marvolo Gaunt's ring, because he believed it contained the Resurrection Stone, one of the three Deathly Hallows. He wanted to use the stone to communicate with and possibly see his deceased loved ones. However, Dumbledore was aware that the ring was also a horcrux, 
carrying a piece of Voldemort's soul and would be cursed. He was willing to risk putting on the ring despite the potential danger because of his overwhelming desire to reunite with his deceased family and find solace in their presence. Thus, his decision to put on the ring was driven by a mix of curiosity, his thirst for knowledge, and his longing for his lost loved ones. Despite his good intentions, the choice ultimately had dire consequences. This dark Harry Potter theory totally changes Voldemort's defense against the Dark Arts curse. Today, we're going to be discussing a rather compelling theory pertaining to the Defense Against the Dark Arts posting at Hogwarts School. I first saw this theory on Reddit, so shout out to Wordhammer on the HP subreddit for the inspiration. Defense Against the Dark Arts is a core subject taught at Hogwarts that purportedly teaches students how to defend themselves against dark magic, creatures, and curses, though I'm not sure this subject has been particularly successful in this regard. The curriculum covers a wide range of topics, including recognizing and repelling dark creatures, identifying and countering curses, and learning protective spells. But for as long as Harry attended Hogwarts, and actually for many decades prior, the subject had a particularly high turnover rate. Scratch that, a ludicrously high turnover rate. Every single year that Harry attended Hogwarts, he had a completely different professor that taught the subject in an entirely different way. As you can imagine, this was pretty disruptive to the learning process. And who could be responsible for such a mess? Why, Lord Voldemort, of course. This is explained to Harry by Dumbledore. Oh, he definitely wanted the Defense Against the Dark Arts job, said Dumbledore. The aftermath of our little meeting proved that. You see, we have never been able to keep a Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher for longer than a year since I refused the post to Lord Voldemort. And it all dates back to young Tom Riddle's graduation from Hogwarts. Shortly after completing his studies, Tom Riddle expressed his desire to become the Defense Against the Dark Arts professor at his alma mater. Partially driven by his love for the school, and partially driven by his fascination with the dark arts. And he didn't waste any time, quickly submitting an application to then headmaster Armando Dippet. After some time, Dippet ended up refusing Riddle's application, citing his age, but did encourage him to reapply in the future if he was still interested. More than two decades later, Riddle emerged as the enigmatic and notorious Lord Voldemort. Seeking an opportunity to return to Hogwarts, Voldemort once again pursued the coveted Defense Against the Dark Arts position. However, this time, Albus Dumbledore had assumed the role of headmaster. Recognizing Voldemort's dark intentions, Dumbledore staunchly rejected his application. Despite Voldemort's ulterior motives of using the application as a pretext to conduct research on dark magic, recruit followers, and conceal one of his horcruxes, he was enraged by the denial of his return to the school. After his denial, Voldemort sought vengeance by jinxing the position, ensuring that from that point onward, no one could maintain the Defense Against the Dark Arts post for more than one year. And as far as conventional understanding of the Harry Potter story goes, everyone has always accepted this fact at face value. No one can hold a position for more than a year, and that's about all there is to it. There's no explanation for why one year or how one year is actually enforced. Which makes me wonder, how is it that this jinx actually works? We know the outcome, but have very little information on the process. Today, I want to discuss a compelling theory which adds a layer of depth to Voldemort's nefarious jinx, perhaps suggesting that the jinx is far more sinister than meets the eye. In essence, the sinister theory posits that whoever occupies the data position is destined to be confronted by his or her worst fears. From the moment they sign the dotted line and occupy the position, this fate becomes inevitable. Going through the list of data professors that occupied the role during Harry's time at Hogwarts, let's take a closer look. Quirinus Quirrell Quirinus Quirrell was an English half-blood wizard born sometime in the 1960s. Quirrell was a highly unusual and delicate, but talented student, and was teased profusely at school, making the anxious Quirrell even more anxious. He also had feelings of inadequacy which led to him taking a particular interest in the dark arts, a highly complicated and dangerous field of magic that could perhaps garner Quirrell the attention and respect that he always longed for. 
In 1990, after teaching for several years as the Muggle Studies Professor at Hogwarts, Quirrell became, shall we say, fed up. This led to him taking a year-long sabbatical in order to gain first-hand experience in the field. However, Quirrell's real objective was to find Lord Voldemort. Fueled by his intense need to be recognized and acknowledged, Quirrell set off with the belief that if he was the one to find Voldemort, he would be praised by all of the wizarding world. And to find Voldemort he did. However, things didn't go exactly according to plan, as he was easily manipulated and controlled by Voldemort. Voldemort recounts just how easy Quirrell was to manipulate. A wizard, young, foolish, and gullible, wandered across my path in the forest I'd made my home. Oh, he seemed the very chance I'd been dreaming of, for he was a teacher at Dumbledore's school. He was easy to bend to my will. He brought me back to this country, and after a while, I took possession of his body, to supervise him closely as it carried out my orders. For as long as Quirrell was alive, his greatest desire was to be recognized. He was intelligent, capable, and more than willing to put the work in. But for some reason, he was never properly acknowledged. Contrary to this, Quirrell's greatest fear was to never be recognized, living out a life where his contributions to society were continually swept under the rug. After being overpowered by Voldemort, Quirrell was forced to face this fear head on. Under the Dark Lord's control, he was devalued, used, and then thrown away. The worst part of it all was that his death was never even investigated. Fate was not kind to the poor misguided Quirrell, and he ended up facing his greatest fears in the worst way possible. Gilderoy Lockhart In adolescence, Lockhart was a clever, good-looking boy, and when he realized quite early on that he was magical, it only went to his head, inflating his already massive ego even further. In 1975, Lockhart began attending Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. When he first walked through the doors of the school, he was met with disappointment, as he came to the crushing realization that at a school for witches and wizards, he was just another magical young boy. In the muggle world, Gilderoy was exceptional, but here he didn't stand out, and that's all he ever longed for. In adulthood, we are introduced to a Lockhart that's ostentatious, egotistical, and quite frankly, delusional. Over the course of his life, he capitalized on the achievements of genuinely powerful witches and wizards by, quite deviously, implementing memory charms that made them forget altogether what they had done. With no one to lay claim to these accomplishments, and no one to refute that it wasn't Lockhart who had achieved them, he claimed them for himself. Which leads me to Lockhart's biggest fear, being exposed as nothing exceptional. You see, Lockhart's whole existence was a facade, an attempt at conveying to the outside world that he was more amazing than he really was. And during his time as data professor, Lockhart's biggest fear finally came true when he was properly exposed. Remus Lupin To me, Remus Lupin was unquestionably the best defense against a dark arts professor, but that still didn't give him any purchase with regards to staying on past his first year in the role. Perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of Lupin's existence was that he suffered from lycanthropy, a magical affliction that transforms witches, wizards into werewolves. Lupin was afflicted with this disease at a very young age after being infected by Fenrir Greyback, which meant that he had to deal with it for most of his existence. And perhaps one of Lupin's greatest fears was that he a was exposed as a werewolf, mainly due to the stigma towards werewolves in wizarding society, and b that he would lose control in his werewolf form and risk hurting those closest to him. And while serving as professor for Defense Against the Dark Arts, Lupin faced both of these scenarios in a relatively short period of time. Barty Crouch Jr. Fake Moody In the 1994-1995 school year, Barty Crouch Jr., disguised as Professor Alistair Moody via Polyjuice Potion, took on the role of Data Professor. Interestingly, despite being an active Death Eater, Barty Crouch Jr. did a fairly good job of teaching the subject. However, while acting as the imposter professor, he was ultimately forced to confront numerous challenging situations that ultimately led to the manifestation of his fears. Firstly, in order to maintain his disguise, he had to kill his own father, Barty Crouch Sr., who was a prominent figure in the Ministry of Magic and staunchly opposed to Voldemort. This act demonstrated his loyalty to Voldemort, but also highlighted the fear and desperation that drove him. Additionally, Barty Crouch Jr.'s involvement in the Triwizard Tournament which was manipulated to aid Voldemort's resurrection, led to him missing the significant moment when his master returned. 
This missed opportunity likely intensified his fear and anxiety about his own standing with Voldemort and the consequences if he failed to deliver. Barty Crouch Jr.'s greatest fears revolved around failing in his mission to serve Voldemort and the consequences that would come with it. He was known for his unwavering commitment to the Dark Lord, and he would have been afraid of disappointing Voldemort or facing his wrath if he were to make a mistake or fail in any way. And at the end of the same school year, when Barty Crouch Jr. was finally exposed as an imposter, he was subjected to the Dementor's Kiss, a fate that eradicated his soul. This encounter with the Dementor further solidified the theme of fear in his storyline, leaving him devoid of any hope or identity. Dolores Umbridge Dolores Umbridge's tenure as the Defense Against the Dark Arts professor was marked by her strict and oppressive teaching methods. Appointed by the Ministry of Magic, Umbridge's primary aim was to control the curriculum and ensure that the Ministry's propaganda was enforced. While her time as the data professor did not typically involve facing her fears, it did bring about challenging situations that revealed her true nature and ideology. Umbridge's fear was not related to personal vulnerabilities or past traumas, but rather a fear of losing control, the fear of anything she considered chaotic or outside of her authority. Furthermore, Umbridge was incredibly prejudiced. She loathed any and all kinds of magical creatures and held a certain amount of disdain for Muggleborns. Ultimately, Umbridge has her authority completely destroyed, then falls victim to half-breeds and creatures, all because she was deceived by a Muggleborn. Ouch. Harry Potter Though not an official Defense Against the Dark Arts professor, Harry Potter did covertly teach the subject to his peers behind closed doors during Umbridge's rule over Hogwarts. At this point in time, Dumbledore's army is formed, and Harry teaches his friends the ways of the Patronus charm in the Room of Requirement. And, as it would appear, not even Harry, who unofficially taught the subject, was exempt from Voldemort's curse. In this same year, Harry's relationship with Cho implodes. He's caught by Umbridge as a result of his most hated rival, Draco, and he even ends up losing the closest thing to a parent he had left, Sirius. Having lost his parents at a very young age, I think that Harry's greatest fear was feeling alone in the world, devoid of friends and family. At this point in the story, I'd argue that Harry had a closer relationship with Sirius than anyone else, largely due to the connection with his parents. Snape Severus Snape became the Defense Against the Dark Arts professor during Harry's sixth year at Hogwarts. In theory, Severus Snape was the perfect Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. He had a profound understanding of both sides of the magical spectrum and knew more about the Dark Arts than most, making him the perfect candidate to teach students defense. However, not even Snape, who vied for the data teaching position for so many years, seemed to be exempt from Voldemort's wicked curse. It was in this same school year that Snape had to begin taking action with regards to his perceived allegiances. Snape was a bad guy turned a good guy, and that's confirmed later on. But for a while, it's a little unclear what side he's truly on. At the end of the school year, Snape is forced to choose his side, ruining his reputation with those he respects, even if it was mainly just for the optics. Snape's deepest fear was that he would fail to fulfill his promise to protect Lily's son, Harry, due to his own past mistakes. Central to this responsibility was his partnership with Dumbledore, the only person who truly understood Snape's underlying motives. Ironically, in the same year, Snape found himself faced with the daunting task of killing Dumbledore. This unimaginable act would have undoubtedly left Snape feeling overwhelmingly scared and isolated in his internal turmoil. Amicus Caro The Caros, Electo and Amicus, took up postings as professors during Harry's seventh year at Hogwarts, in a time when Voldemort's influence had taken hold of the school. Their appointment was part of the Death Eaters' plan to indoctrinate students with dark magic and suppress any form of resistance. Teaching not only allowed the Caros to spread their twisted ideology, but also exposed them to situations that forced them to confront their own fears. Firstly, as Death Eaters, the Caros were fervently loyal to Voldemort. Witnessing the fall of the Dark Lord, as Harry Potter and his allies grew stronger in their fight against evil, would have been a major blow to their beliefs and an encounter with their deepest fear, the potential loss of their Dark Lord's power and influence. Furthermore, their actions as professors aligned with Voldemort's oppressive regime 
inevitably led to their downfall. After Voldemort's defeat, the Caros were captured by the Order of the Phoenix and sent to Azkaban, the prison they had managed to avoid until then. This turn of events forced them to confront the fear and despair of losing their freedom and facing the consequences of their actions. In a cruel twist of fate, Harry Potter, who had often been a target of the Caro's cruelty, retaliated by using the Cruciatus Curse on Amicus when he spat insultingly at Professor McGonagall. This act provided a taste of their own medicine, causing the Caros to experience the pain and suffering that they had inflicted on others. This served as a moment of reckoning, forcing them to confront the fear and anguish they had willingly inflicted on their victims. Closing Thoughts Voldemort's curse on the defense against the Dark Arts data position can be seen as a direct response to the insult of his rejection. Believing himself to be the most qualified candidate for the role, Voldemort designed the curse to compel any other contenders to demonstrate their superior suitability. The curse ultimately concludes when Voldemort dies, not due to the general rule that curses end with the death of their caster, but rather because he himself no longer has the opportunity to assume the position. The Real Reason Snape Created Sectum Sempra Today, we're going to be diving into a theory addressing the real reasoning for Snape's motivation to create his signature dark curse, Sectum Sempra. While a student at Hogwarts, Severus Snape scribbled all sorts of spells and curses into his advanced potion making textbook under the moniker The Half Blood Prince. And when Harry first takes Slughorn's potions class, He's fortunate enough to find the very same textbook that a young, troubled Snape once jotted pure gold into. This book is the property of the Half-Blood Prince, and Harry ends up using the book for quite some time, as for each and every one of Slughorn's lessons, the book provided easier and clearer instructions that he could follow. The book was like having cheat codes to all of the potions lessons. But the book didn't just contain advice on how to make potions or perfect existing spells, there were also spells written inside that were totally new to Harry, spells he hadn't heard of before. Because you see, these were spells that Snape had created himself. One such spell was Sectum Sempra. We first see Sectum Sempra in the films when Harry uses it on Malfoy in the Half Blood Prince. The name Sectum Sempra comes from the combination of two Latin words, Sectus, which means having been cut, and Semper, which means always. Sectum Sempra is a vicious dark curse that acts like an invisible sword, causing lacerations, hemorrhaging, and cuts upon its target. Often after being struck, the target will lay there motionless as they lose blood. The following excerpt describes the effects of the spell. Blood spurted from Malfoy's face and chest, as though he had been slashed with an invisible sword. He staggered backward and collapsed onto the waterlogged floor with a great splash his wand falling from his limp right hand. Slipping and staggering, Harry got to his feet and plunged toward Malfoy, whose face was now shining scarlet, his white hands scrabbling at his blood-soaked chest. Based on the description above, it's pretty clear that Sectum Sempra is an incredibly vicious dark curse, and certainly not something that school-aged children should be tampering with. And before Sectum Sempra, Snape also invented a plethora of other spells, including Lever Corpus, a spell that causes the target to be lifted into the air by their ankle, essentially hanging them upside down, Libera Corpus, the counter charm to Lever Corpus, the Muffliato charm, which creates a buzzing noise that prevents others from overhearing private discussions, and Langlock, a spell which temporarily glues the victim's tongue to the roof of their mouth. But the thing about all of Snape's other spells is that, compared to Sectum Sempra, they were fairly innocuous. Which makes me wonder, what prompted the massive leap up in violence level from his earlier creations? During his time at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, Severus Snape was subjected to relentless bullying by a group of students known as the Marauders, which was comprised of James Potter, Sirius Black, Remus Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew. Led by James, the group often targeted Snape due to his introverted and isolated nature. They frequently mocked him, insulted his appearance, and belittled his talents. Their bullying extended beyond mere verbal torment, as they also jinxed and humiliated Snape with spells, leaving him vulnerable and humiliated. This bullying not only deeply affected Snape, but also had lasting consequences in his relationships and actions later in life. 
And the creation of each and every one of Snape's spells had one thing in common. They were used to deter these bullies. But in what situation could Snape have warranted the use of Sectumsempra? Why would he have escalated things to such a level? Conventional understanding of the situation would suggest that Snape created this dark curse to be prepared for any eventuality. But I think there may have been a specific reason behind the creation of this spell, and it involves Remus Lupin. You see, Remus was different from the other marauders. In early life, he was attacked by the notorious werewolf Fenrir Greyback. Striking in the middle of the night, Greyback bit young Remus and infected him with lycanthropy, the affliction associated with werewolves. Fenrir did this in an act of revenge against Remus's father, Lyle. And from that point onward, Remus's life became a lot more complicated. Fortunately for Remus, he ended up finding a very accommodating group of friends in the Marauders, who were completely understanding of his condition and did whatever they could to make his life seem as normal as possible. And one fateful evening, Snape became the subject of one of Marauder Sirius Black's cruel tricks, one that very well could have gotten him killed. Professor Snape was at school with us. He fought very hard against my appointment to the Defense Against the Dark Arts job. He has been telling Dumbledore all year that I am not to be trusted. He has his reasons, you see. Sirius here played a trick on him which nearly killed him, a trick which involved me. Black made a derisive noise. It served him right, he sneered, sneaking around, trying to find out what we were up to, hoping he could get us expelled. Severus was very interested in where I went every month, Lupin told Harry, Ron, and Hermione. We were in the same year, you know, and we uh, didn't like each other very much. He especially disliked James, jealous, I think, of James's talent on the Quidditch field. Anyway, Snape had seen me crossing the grounds with Madame Pomfrey one evening as she led me toward the Whomping Willow to transform. Sirius thought it would be uh, amusing to tell Snape all he had to do was prod the knot on the tree trunk with a long stick, and he'd be able to get in after me. Well, of course, Snape tried it. If he'd got as far as this house, he'd have met a fully grown werewolf. But your father, who'd heard what Sirius had done, went after Snape and pulled him back, at great risk to his life. Snape glimpsed me, though, at the end of the tunnel. He was forbidden by Dumbledore to tell anybody, but from that time on, he knew what I was. So that's why Snape doesn't like you, said Harry slowly, because he thought you were in on the joke? From the passage above, we can derive two things. First, it would have become immediately apparent to Snape that these jokes played on him by the Marauders were now progressing to new and dangerous heights. And second, Snape would have now become completely aware of Lupin's lycanthropy. And what action can we expect from a powerful, creative wizard facing all kinds of adversity? Why, the creation of a vicious dark curse, of course, Sectum Sempra. But here's where it gets juicier. The current law does not provide any other conclusive evidence to support the idea that Snape had further encounters with Remus in his werewolf form. However, given the complex and intertwined history of Snape and the Marauders, it seems highly probable that there were other occasions where Snape had run-ins with Lupin during his werewolf transformations. These encounters might have been intentionally omitted from the canon to maintain the element of surprise and suspense surrounding the Marauders' secret activities. Despite the lack of explicit accounts, it is reasonable to assume that Snape's encounters with Lupin's werewolf form had a significant impact on his perception of Lupin and fueled his long-standing enmity towards him. I think Snape created Sectumsempra for Lupin, and I think he ended up using it on him. I also believe that he created his counter curse for him as well. Here's why. Though I will admit that this is more of a movie thing than a book thing, Remus Lupin, at least in the films, was adorned with scars. Conventional wisdom would suggest that these scars came from one of two things. One, his wounds as a result of being attacked by Fenrir Greyback, or two, self-inflicted wounds as a result of not taking his Wolfsbane potion. He claims he bit and scratched himself for not consuming this potion. But I think that some of Remus's worst scars were inflicted by Severus Snape. During the Battle of the Seven Potters, Snape attempts to use Sectum Sempra to sever the hand of a fellow Death Eater, but due to a slip, he ends up accidentally cutting off George Weasley's left ear instead. After this incident, Remus is very quick to recognize Snape's work, almost as if he'd been subjected to it himself once before. He lost an ear, lost an Snape's work, and because George Weasley's ear was cut off by Sectum Sempra, it was gone for good 
as curse wounds are generally unable to be healed. And it may be for this very reason that Lupin has visible marks on his body after so many years. They were inflicted by a vicious dark curse. Given that the curse in his potions textbook is labelled with four enemies, some will argue that it was for no one in particular, and others will argue that Sectumsempra was actually created to use against James Potter. The main argument for this being that Snape used a very similar looking spell on James once upon a time. There was a flash of light and a gash appeared on the side of James's face, spattering his robes with blood. And while it is true that Snape did cause a gash on the side of James's face, it is important to note that Sectumsempra is an incredibly dangerous curse. In the Half-Blood Prince, when Harry used the Hex on Draco, the effect was far more severe, causing Draco to collapse, bleed profusely, and require immediate medical attention. In fact, if Snape hadn't shown up and used the counter curse for Narasen and Tor, it's possible that Draco would have died. If Snape had indeed used Sectumsempra on James, it is likely that the injuries would have been more serious and left lasting scarring, as dark magic injuries are not easily healed. Therefore, it is highly improbable that Snape used Sectumsempra on James, as it is not consistent with the expected outcome of the spell. Furthermore, given that it's unlikely that Snape did use Sectumsempra on James, how would Lupin recognize it after the Battle of the Seven Potters? It's also entirely possible that Snape created the counter curse Vulnera Senentor just for Lupin, anticipating that he may one day get into an altercation with Remus' werewolf form. Snape, being the bright young wizard he was, would have likely also considered Lupin reverting back to his human form after the fight was over. Not wanting to kill Lupin, but only desiring to send a message, Vulnera Senentor would have come in handy once Remus reverted back. Of course, all of these things are just theories. However, I do think that they adequately address certain aspects of the Harry Potter story that are relatively unexplored, such as the unlikely void of Remus's Hogwarts years, where seemingly nothing went wrong in his werewolf form, Snape's need to up the ante and create a potentially lethal dark curse, and Remus immediately recognizing Snape's work, despite Snape having never used Sectumsempra on James after all. Why does the Sorting Hat choose Half-Bloods for Slytherin? The question, put quite succinctly, is this. If Salazar Slytherin was such an advocate for pure-blood supremacy, how is it that, many centuries later, his own Hogwarts house allows Half-Bloods? Specifically, we're going to be tackling this question in relation to the Sorting Hat, as the Hat is ultimately responsible for student placement. The Sorting Hat, a magical artifact at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, has the essential task of assigning new students to one of the four houses, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, or Slytherin. Each house was founded by one of the four original founders of Hogwarts, Godric Gryffindor, Helga Hufflepuff, Rowena Ravenclaw, and Salazar Slytherin. The hat was created when Godric Gryffindor pulled his completely regular hat off of his head and made the suggestion to the other founders that, using their collective magic, they enchant the hat and turn it into a sentient being. The purpose of this was simple. They wanted to leave something behind that could carry on their house legacies long after their deaths. As long as they were alive, the founders could easily select students for their houses based on their own values and characteristics. But one day they wouldn't be there, which led to their desire to leave behind something that was capable of selecting students. And why was this so important, you may ask? Well, each of the Hogwarts founders valued very different things, imbuing their own characteristics into their respective houses. These characteristics would become the defining attributes of each house. These attributes can be summed up in the Sorting Hat's own words. By Gryffindor, the bravest were, prized far beyond the rest. For Ravenclaw, the cleverest, would always be the best. For Hufflepuff, hard workers were, most worthy of admission, and power-hungry Slytherin loved those of great ambition. In essence, Godric Gryffindor valued bravery, Helga Hufflepuff prized loyalty, Rowena Ravenclaw sought wisdom, and Salazar Slytherin prized cunning and ambition. However, it is certainly worth noting that these are not the only traits attributed with each house, just some of the more noteworthy ones. To perform its task, the hat uses legilimency, which is the art of magically navigating through a person's mind. As soon as the hat is placed on your head, there's nothing it won't know about you. This is reflected in the Sorting Hat's own song. 
There's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see. But one major consideration that needs to be made here is that Salazar Slytherin's vision for his house went far beyond these basic traits. You see, he was a firm believer in the supremacy of pure blood wizards and sought to admit only those with pure magical lineage into his house, and it was this very belief that created tension among the other founders and eventually led to Slytherin's departure from the school. Given this history, it may seem contradictory that the Sorting Hat, designed to select students based on the founders' values, would place half-blood wizards like Severus Snape, Dolores Umbridge, and Tom Riddle into Slytherin House. Today, I want to explore the reasons behind the Sorting Hat selection of half-bloods for Slytherin, despite the house's foundation on pure blood supremacy. Blood status is one of the most controversial aspects of the wizarding world, a concept in which wizarding families can be distinguished by the level of magically endowed family members. Generally speaking, people are slotted into one of the following categories. Pure blood, half blood, muggle born, or simply muggle. Pure blood refers to a witch or wizard who has magical ancestry on both sides of their family and has no known muggle, non-magical ancestors. Half blood refers to a witch or wizard with mixed blood and heritage. That is, they have magical abilities and come from a magical bloodline, but also have at least one muggle parent or ancestor. Muggle-born refers to a witch or wizard with no magical ancestry, who is born to non-magical parents but possesses magical abilities. And lastly, muggle refers to a non-magical person with no magical blood or magical abilities. And what's worth mentioning is that Slytherin's vision for his house was not merely a preference for pure blood students, but rather a strict requirement. He believed that only those who could prove their magical heritage should be admitted to Hogwarts, instilling this belief into the very foundation of his house. So I ask again, what caused the infiltration of half-bloods into Slytherin House? By admitting them, it appears to contradict the values of the house itself. The first thing we need to look at is how Slytherin House, the wizarding world, has evolved over time. Hogwarts School was founded in 990 AD, and with such a considerable time span, it goes without saying that much changed in the wizarding world from then to now, with Slytherin House being no exception. Here are my thoughts. It would appear that, over the centuries, Slytherin House has undergone a gradual transformation as the values and beliefs of the wizarding world evolved. While Salazar Slytherin's original vision for his house was centered around blood purity and the supremacy of pure blood wizards, I'm of the impression that the house has since adapted to accommodate a more diverse range of students and values. One factor contributing to this evolution is the influence of the other founders on the Sorting Hat selection criteria. As the Sorting Hat was imbued with the thoughts and values of all four founders, it has the ability to adapt and change its selection process to reflect the evolving values of the school and the wizarding community. This means that, over time, the Sorting Hat may have placed less emphasis on blood purity when sorting students into Slytherin House, allowing for a more diverse range of students to be admitted. Another factor contributing to the evolution of Slytherin House is the changing values within the wizarding world. As the harmful consequences of blood purity beliefs and discrimination against muggle-borns and half-bloods became increasingly apparent, many wizards and witches began to reject these ideas in favor of a more inclusive and egalitarian approach. This shift in values likely influenced the students sorted into Slytherin, as well as the house's overall culture and reputation. The presence of half-bloods and muggle-borns in Slytherin House also played a role in its evolution. As these students brought their own perspectives, values, and experiences to the house, they contributed to a more diverse and inclusive environment within Slytherin. This diversity allowed for a broader range of qualities and traits to be valued and celebrated within the house, moving it further away from Salazar Slytherin's original vision of pure blood supremacy. However, despite these changes, it would be a lie to reject the notion that the legacy of Salazar Slytherin's vision for his house still lingers. Slytherin House continues, and will forever continue, to be associated with dark magic, ambition, and cunning, and its members are often judged based on the actions of past Slytherins who upheld the blood purity ideals. However, the evolution of Slytherin House over time demonstrates that it is possible for the values and identity of a house to change, reflecting the growth and progress of the wizarding world as a whole. The growth of the wizarding world with regards to prejudice, as depicted in the Harry Potter series, can be seen as an allegory for our own real world. Throughout the series, we witness the harmful consequences of discrimination, prejudice, 
and a belief in the supremacy of certain groups over others. And though our own world has made significant developments over the centuries, I'd venture to say that we, like Southern House, have a long way to go. But while this purported evolution of Southern House is an easy idea to warm up to, I may simply be giving the house too much credit. It's entirely possible that the placement of Half-Bloods and Muggleborns into Slytherin is the product of something else altogether, and as it happens I've got a theory prepared which addresses just that scenario. I think it's possible that, when enchanting the Sorting Hat, Godric Gryffindor placed a loophole on the hat, unbeknown to the school's other founders, that would undermine Slytherin's advocacy for pure-blood witches and wizards. Godric Gryffindor, known for his bravery and chivalry, foresaw the potential problems that Salazar Slytherin's discriminatory views could pose for the school and the other founders, and in order to counteract this, created a loophole in the sorting hat to allow non-pureblood students to be sorted into Slytherin House. This act would ensure that the house would not become a breeding ground for pureblood supremacy and would also help to promote diversity and inclusivity within Hogwarts. I imagine that this loophole could have been introduced in a few different ways. 1. Subtly influencing the Sorting Hat's decision-making process Gryffindor could have included a hidden enchantment that would encourage the Hat to consider non-pureblood students for Slytherin House, regardless of their blood status. 2. Exploiting Salazar Slytherin's own enchantments Gryffindor might have found a way to manipulate Slytherin's enchantments on the Hat, turning them against his own intentions and allowing non-pureblood students to be sorted into his house. 3 creating a failsafe mechanism. Gryffindor could have created a failsafe within the hat's enchantment that would activate if the other founders were no longer present, allowing the hat to sort non-purebloods into Slytherin House in their absence. This is just a theory, but it would certainly highlight Godric Gryffindor's foresight and commitment to ensuring that Hogwarts remained a diverse and inclusive institution. It also helps that the hat they use for the sorting hat happened to be one of Godric's own. Another factor to consider here is that it's never fully explained why Salazar left the school. We know that him and the other founders disagreed, and we know that he had a major disagreement with Godric Gryffindor prompting his departure, but it's never properly explained what the exact catalyst was for this. On this line of thought, it's entirely possible that, after unveiling Gryffindor's loophole in the sorting hat, he simply no longer wanted anything to do with his co-founders. This dark theory completely flips Harry Potter's ending. Today, we're going to be discussing a horrific Harry Potter theory that bears the potential to completely flip the Harry Potter ending on its head. It involves, you guessed it, our main antagonist Lord Voldemort, and a scenario in which Voldemort survives. Voldemort is defeated, at least markedly, twice in the Harry Potter story. His first defeat was at the Potter residence in Godric's Hollow, where his rebounding curse, thanks to Lily's loving sacrifice, shot back at him and ripped his soul from his destroyed body. This marked the temporary end of Voldemort, and the end of the first Wizarding War. But Voldemort certainly wasn't done. Oh no no. In 1995, Voldemort made his resurgence, more motivated than ever to take back control of the Wizarding World and get revenge on the boy who had defeated him. However, this didn't work out too well for him either, as shown in his final showdown with Harry during the Battle of Hogwarts. Tom Riddle hit the floor with a mundane finality, his body feeble and shrunken, the white hands empty, the snake-like face vacant and unknowing. Voldemort was dead, killed by his own rebounding curse, and Harry stood with two wands in his hand, staring down at his enemy's shell, and after this final fated duel, it's generally accepted that Voldemort was dead. In the films, Voldemort's body broke off into thousands of pieces and vanished into nothing, and in the books, the former Dark Lord was reduced to a corpse just like anyone else. It's ironic that Voldemort, who also viewed death dying as pure weakness, a fate reserved for the unimportant and powerless, would end up as a corpse just like everyone else thrown into a pile of other bodies in the chamber off the Great Hall. They moved Voldemort's body and laid it in the chamber off the hall, away from the bodies of Fred, Tonks, Lupin, Colin Creevy, and fifty others who died fighting him. Eventually, after all of the dust has settled, Voldemort's body is moved into a resting chamber within the walls of Hogwarts. 
something that the films fail to mention altogether. It's here, somewhere entirely unspecified within the castle, that Voldemort purportedly lay for the remainder of eternity. Or did he? The theory that I want to put forth today suggests that Voldemort, by way of, you guessed it, Horcruxes, was able to survive. Horcruxes are, as most of you will know, an object in which a dark witch or wizard has imbued part of their soul. The purpose of doing this is to make it difficult for the witch or wizard to be completely killed, achieving, in a sense, some form of immortality. Each Horcrux ties a piece of the individual's soul to the mortal realm, grounding it, and in Voldemort's case, he happened to create many of these life-preserving objects. By the end of the story, Voldemort's presumably out of Horcruxes, which is why Harry was able to kill him. However, today, we're going to explore the possibility that Voldemort may have actually had one last stake in the mortal realm that was overlooked. Some fans have speculated that the soul of Lord Voldemort was not fully destroyed when Harry defeated him at the end of the series. Instead, it is suggested that a piece of Voldemort's soul remained hidden within Harry, waiting for the opportunity to take over his body and regenerate. We know that for most of the books and films, Harry carried a piece of Voldemort's soul with him, that is, until his showdown with Voldemort in the Forbidden Forest. Voldemort had raised his wand, his head was still tilted to one side, like a curious child, wondering what would happen if he proceeded. Harry looked back into the red eyes and wanted it to happen now, quickly, while he could still stand, before he lost control, before he betrayed fear. He saw the mouth move in a flash of green light and everything was gone. At this point, Harry wakes up in a sort of limbo where he's given the option of returning to the land of the living or moving on. The prevailing argument for why Harry has this option is because he wasn't killed, but merely the piece of Voldemort inside of him. Voldemort had foolishly rebuilt his body using Harry Potter's blood, which meant that both of them were protected by Lily's loving sacrifice. Dumbledore confirms this. He took your blood and rebuilt his living body with it. Your blood in his veins, Harry. Lily's protection inside both of you. He tethered you to life while he lives. Essentially, because Harry's soul is now whole and pure, he is given the opportunity to return to his life as just Harry. All he has to do at this point is choose to go back. However, I have an issue with this. The method by which Voldemort chose to kill Harry was via Avada Kedavra, which many have speculated kills you by magically ripping the soul from the body. At this point, soul is separated from body, with your body remaining in the mortal plane and your soul moving on. From here, you'll end up in one of three places. Back on Earth as a ghost, assuming you have unfinished business, Limbo, where Harry makes his choice to return, or the wizarding afterlife. The afterlife in Harry Potter is never clearly defined, but what is clear is that it's the best place you can go upon dying, an idyllic place akin to a state of nirvana. If you want a full explanation of what happens, then check out my video, What Happens to Wizards When They Die? The Wizarding Afterlife Explained. If it was indeed the piece of Voldemort's soul fragment that was destroyed by his killing curse and not Harry's own soul, then why was Harry's soul sent to limbo? By my logic, Harry was still protected by the blood that he and Voldemort shared, so it stands to reason that there's no rational explanation for why Harry's soul would have been sent off to limbo along with the piece of Voldemort's soul. The argument that I want to make here is that Voldemort's soul fragment inside of Harry was never destroyed. When hit via Voldemort's killing curse in the Forbidden Forest, the spell had the desired effect. It ripped Harry's soul from his body, but because of him being tied to the mortal realm via blood, he of course had the option to come back. Okay, so now you might be asking, but what about the mutilated baby-like creature that Harry sees in Limbo? Wasn't that supposed to be representative of Voldemort's newly destroyed soul fragment, the same piece that resided in Harry? Harry turned slowly on the spot, and his surroundings seemed to invent themselves before his eyes. He had spotted the thing that was making the noises. It had the form of a small, naked child curled on the ground, its skin raw and rough, flayed looking, and it lay shuddering under a seat where it had been left, unwanted, stuffed out of sight, struggling for breath. 
Most fans believe that the child on the floor of King's Cross was in fact the part of Voldemort's soul that previously resided within Harry. After all, Harry carried a piece of Voldemort with him for his entire life, and so it seems to make sense that, with Harry dying and the soul shard now destroyed, it would follow him to the afterlife. However, though this is close to the answer, it's actually wrong. According to JK Rowling, the being stuck in limbo with Harry was actually just a representation of the current state of Voldemort's soul. What exactly was the mutilated baby-like creature Harry saw at King's Cross in chapter 35 of Hallows? I've been asked this a lot. It is the last piece of soul Voldemort possesses. When Voldemort attacks Harry, they both fall temporarily unconscious, and both their souls, Harry's undamaged and healthy, Voldemort stunted and maimed, appear in the limbo where Harry meets Dumbledore. If both Harry and Voldemort's souls are accounted for in limbo, then where is the soul fragment in Harry that was supposed to have been newly destroyed? I think it lived on inside of Harry. Voldemort may have been defeated at the end of the Battle of Hogwarts, but it certainly wasn't the first time he'd been defeated to such an observable extent, and it absolutely doesn't mean that he had necessarily exhausted all options with regards to his return to the mortal realm. With Voldemort's apparent defeat, the Wizarding World was able to finally exercise a collective sigh of relief. Hogwarts was rebuilt, the Ministry of Magic was restructured, Diagon Alley returned to its prosperous former state, and most importantly, Harry was able to grow up and live a normal life. But here's where it gets dark. I think that as Harry grew older and more powerful, the parasitic soul fragment inside of him lay dormant, biding its time and conserving its energy for the day that it would strike. Entirely unknown to Harry, this piece of Voldemort's soul was still latched onto him, sucking away undetectable amounts of energy, learning from him, and most importantly, plotting its return. I'm of the impression that on one dark day, the parasite inside of Harry became powerful enough to control his body, leading to the indirect rebirth of Lord Voldemort through Harry, using him as a vessel in the same way that he used Quirrell, just to a greater extent. This theory, unsettling as it is, challenges the happy ending of the Harry Potter series and poses the idea that the apparent harmony in the Wizarding World after Voldemort's demise is not as permanent as it may have seemed. According to this theory, darkness and evil may always be lurking in the shadows, waiting for the opportunity to resurface. And that's it for today's video. What did you guys think? Which were your favorite theories of 2023? What do you want to see covered this year? Leave a comment down below. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live.